recording. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us for this installment of the Coach Development Webinar Series. Um, I am delighted to have uh, Matt Joseph with us this afternoon. Uh, Matt is a coach developer with the Football Association. I had the pleasure of working with him on one of my qualifications uh, over the last uh, 18 months, um, and he's got a great presentation to, to share with you and hopefully lots of engagement. In terms of uh, that, could you please keep your microphone on mute throughout the presentation? Uh, we will invite you to uh, unmute at the end uh, and, and ask questions directly, but you can also put questions in the chat box as, uh, as previous webinars, uh, and Matt will try and answer them accordingly. They'll be filtered by myself and Ricardo. The webinar will be recorded, so it'll be shared with you guys afterwards uh, as previous, and as uh, mentioned before on other webinars, if we find ourselves uh, with a hacking situation, we'll uh, abort the webinar if necessary, uh, otherwise we'll try to resolve it and get ourselves um, you know, to continue with the presentation. So. Without further ado, I'll let Matt make a brief introduction about himself. Matt, could you include your playing uh, career highlights as well for us, please, just so everyone knows the quality club that you used to play for, and we'll, sure. go, we'll go from there. Thank you very much, mate. I'm not sure there's many highlights, but um, yeah, thanks, Bobby. Uh, yeah, so my name's Matthew Joseph, and like Bobby said, I worked with him um, when he was at his previous club um, on the qualification. So yeah, I've been involved in football for, for quite a long while. <clears throat> you have to excuse the voice, I've got a bit of a been doing a lot of webinars and stuff at the moment so the voice is going a little bit um so i think probably the best way to give you a brief history i started off as a youngster um playing for arsenal had a brief stint playing um national football international football as as a youth team player then ended up uh playing lower league for about 10 years so and then after that i went into coach coaching pre pretty straight away actually. I was coaching while I was still playing and then went into coach education and I've been at the FA now um, as working in coaching and coach education for the past 13 years. So it's been a been a, a big passion of mine. Um, something that hopefully I'll, I'll get to share with you now. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share um, my screen with you all now. So hopefully um, if you can just give me a, a thumbs up and just let me know if you can see the presentation then that would be great. Is everyone able to see this presentation? Yeah, all good. Brilliant. So, up. so yeah, so uh, having had a, a, a chat with Bobby, and I've, I've still briefly met Ricardo today, it was just an idea to have a, have a chat with you guys about coaching coaches. And I put in there a, a considered approach. My reasoning for that is, it's that coaching, and I, I say this to all, all people all the time, coaching is not easy. If you, if, if you think it's easy or... Um, then I'm suggesting you're probably in the wrong job uh, or the wrong vocation. It's really hard because there's, there's lots of different facets which are going on and every learner is different, um, but you have to have a considered approach to how you want to go about it. There aren't many slides in this presentation because I really want to, to sort of stimulate uh, some conversations and some thought processes. So the idea is that I will have a, in between, like I said, I'll, I'll have a look at the chat box the best I can and answer some of the questions, but really it's about you having a look at some of the stuff that I put down um, and challenging it or taking it on board or just asking some questions just for some more clarification and really just some sense sense making. So I'll give you my version of, of coach education or coach development um, and I'll give you it's really a look at me first because I think you know, it's about knowing yourself and your coaches as learners because we're looking at coaches at the moment so we're looking at this bit of, of self-reflection. So for me I'll read parts of the slides, but it's a coach development is primarily built on understanding yourself and understanding subject knowledge, whatever whatever that might be. Um, we'll come to that a bit later. But the focus of both of those being is there been an awareness of a range of some stimuluses, and there's a few there that I've just put in there aligned to a context, because the answer to any question is well, it depends. It depends on the context. Um, but for me, I try to break it down in pretty simple form. That who's in front of me? What do they know? And how am I going to make this assessment? Um, and so the, the point of all of this is to, is to, once I start to work along and gather some of this sort of information, I can start to think about how I might work with that coach, what that development journey might look like. Um, for the, for the, that makes players and coaches more skillful in the way they operate. Because actually, if we're working with coaches, the idea is for the coaches to then delve with, deeper into their practice and understanding in order to help the learners at the, at the end users, players, um, or whoever's um, 
split end of, of, of the line. But, but for me, there's, I'm going to try and give you some strap lines um, because I quite like quotes, probably useless quotes, but I quite like quotes. So I lose this bit around re reflection. Uh, and I say, well, you're better off looking in the mirror before you look out the window. So before we say, well, no, it's there for, if they're not good enough, then um, the coaches are, well, what have I done? So there has to be that point of self-reflection and think about how, what do I know about the learners? What do I know about learning? Who's in front of me? Why am I making these assessments on where the coaches are at this point? So it always starts with a bit of self-reflection first. And I think if you're, whether you're coaching coaches or whether you're a coach coaching players, there's always, um, there's always great knowledge to be learned from self-reflecting, whether that's pre, during uh, or afterwards. See if I can get this to work. So if we're looking at the development aims, if we're going to develop coaches, um, what does that mean? Just kind of minimise this, sorry. So what does this mean? Well, as, as I mentioned previously, you, you need to know the who. So who's in front of you and have an appreciation and an understanding of, of what and when to develop your coaches. So the diagram on the right-hand side, it's just basically saying I'm, I'm probably one of some people that help an individual. What we're trying to do is make that individual um, empowered so that they take charge of their own learning. But I need to know who's in front of me. I also need to understand what's, the, what's their ability uh, to teach the game. And, and it's often dependent on, on someone's knowledge of the game. So again, the, the quote in there, uh, it says, if two coaches observe a game, they'll both see a version of the game akin to their knowledge of the game. So you could sit next to anyone and like you, all of you guys on this call could watch a handball game and there'll be some consistencies in the things that you see but there'll be some 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 inconsistencies in the things that you might think are important but that's based on on your knowledge and it's based on the experiences that you've had and how you view the game and so we have to be really mindful if i go back to the slide before that these things really power and drive our perceptions of what good looks like what a game looks like and actually, when we're working with coaches, it's not about trying to enforce our perceptions on them, but it's trying to get them to realise what their perceptions are and how that might impact the way that they develop their learners. So it's a really, really subtle difference, but it's something that I I'm really believe passionately about that we really have to understand ourselves first. So actually, the aim is to support coaches to, to better understand their reference indicators, their intentions and their, measure, their measures that they use that are formed from their opinions when trying to meet the needs of their learners. So it really is um, that asking coaches to look at themselves in their mirror first before they start looking at the people that they're trying to teach and, uh, and the things they're trying to learn. And within this, I've sort of just touched on it briefly there. So I'm not sure when that's, that's not happened. Should be one of it. Yeah. So for me, I, I use this little model in my head about to teach to coach and to manage. And they don't all mean the same thing, but they're very similar. So for, for me, teaching is about teaching individuals or teaching people something that they have limited understanding or lack of awareness of. So we'll teach them some stuff. Coaching is reciprocal. So coaching is about getting those people who are doing the doing to understand um, the importance of all the facets around them which help them to be able to apply an action or a performance that's where the coaching bit comes in the management is well though once you've got learners to a point where they can play a game themselves or understand it then we might just have to manage and cajole um in terms of i don't know whether it's motivation or whether it's cajoling um tempo that's just the management part of it but the coaching is where we get into some real detail where we with the learners but it's a real part where we have to recognise it. It's, it's not about us, it's about them. And we are just uh, the facilitators. And, and a real um, good friend of mine and a colleague um, used a phrase ages ago that, that in terms of being a coach developer, whether you're coaching coaches or players, it's when certainly being a coach developer, it's about being a catalyst with this year to agitate and to get the learners to think more deeply about what it is they do. So if I looked at it from a, from a framework, um, and certainly Bobby and I have had loads of conversations from the back of the stuff we've done in universities, and I think this, it's really, if you can have a framework of some stuff um, to work to, it doesn't mean that you, you, 
you have to be obedient to these, but it means that they're there and they're, they're your first port of call. And every individual is different and every situation is different. So some facets of this may or may not be, be applicable. But for me, it's about developing a knowledge of myself, a knowledge of the subject, and that might be the person in front of me. It might be um, the game that they're playing. Uh, to, to also develop an a knowledge of the learner, so who's in front of me, and of learning. What type of, what type of learner are they? How do, how do I keep them connected to their development so that they can uh, move along their journey as best they can? Because I'm again, I'm I'm a, I'm a great believer in we're not there to cut corners. It's not about cutting corners in their learning, but it's about getting learners to accelerate their learning. So in the areas where they can fast track through certain parts without missing anything, then we can help them to do that. Because if we shortcut the learning, the stuff that they'll miss, which at some stage will rear its head, and it'll be really difficult to go back and relearn those things. So for me, this is, like I said, it's about developing stuff, and then it's about ob observing. So, and that's observing performance, the coach's the coach performance, the, the coach interactions, and the coach applications. And then this is this this collaborative approach where we we plan, we share, we devise, or we contribute to a clearly defined and agreed set of performance indicators and references. So the coaches know that when we're going to watch them work, they know what it is that we are that the things that we are going to look at and, and the things that we're we're going to value so that comes to the next bit in terms of the values beliefs behaviors and characteristics so we know the things that we're going to look at which then means we've got a greater understanding of the things that we agree are important so then we can start to measure some stuff now obviously not everything is there isn't a metric for everything to measure some things i'm not i wouldn't say are measurable but they're they're difficult to measure because it becomes individual and so to to measure one individual against another there has to be a clear metric in which you're going to use that for if you're measuring someone's characteristics or their beliefs then they might that might not be something that you want to that you can measure as clearly but once we've been for that process about just reviewing all or some of the specified areas above again it comes back to things you there's that agreement with the coach like i said came back to the slide before coaching is reciprocal it's between the pair of us or between the coach and the group then you're going to make some conclusions based on the review that you've had and they can be shared during performance or post or or post performance or like a post review and that that depends on the learner and on their choice so some of some of the coaches that you'll come across and you'll work with they won't want you to um or they might not feel comfortable with people coming in and stepping into their session and talking to them while they're working so in those situations it's very difficult to make some to review or conclude some stuff as it happens so but it's uh, so that might be more possible at the end of a session but sometimes it's really quite powerful to be able to review in action so again it depends what um what, what the learners prefer but also it's understanding that once you've you've come to that that conclusion and this is how or that agreement and how the learners want to learn that might change because the relationship the relationship between the coach and um, the coach developer if you like changes over time and once you, you that trust is built and um, there's a security in that listen that whoever's there trying to just to help you then you might be able to get to a stage where you're working in action as well as well as before action and post action based on that conclusion of, of what you've you've come to post review you can then make some recommendations um, and this again has to be a clear it's a supportive structure um, of self-developmental learning so again um a little throwaway comment that but i use them quite a lot these these little phrases is is what works for who in what context and why so this really there's a there's a real onus on the coach developer if you like to to really start to delve into and find out who am i working with what we're working on and why do they want me to work with them in this way if if we're not clear on this bit um you, we just won't be as impactful so constantly going back to whenever we're interacting with with coaches that we're working with is constantly trying to understand what we're working on and, and, and who's it for is it for them or is it for me or is it for their players what's the context why are we doing this 
uh, I can't see the chat box at the moment, so I, I don't know if there's any questions. Um, but at this point, I'm quite happy to to take a question from anyone so no, far. I there isn't any. Quickly. There isn't any in the chat box. I've got one though. Um, okay. If, if that's okay. Of course. Um, when you're in, obviously engaging with coaches, there's obviously um, well different coaches, and that will accept you better than others, and that generically has to do with their notion of self-efficacy and, uh, and how comfortable they are being challenged um, uh, and being assessed. Uh, you were mentioning about uh, assessing coaches when they are coaching um, in action, yes. promoting that, that sort of reflection. Um, me as a coach and a bit of uh, as coach developer as well, I came across a few challenges, which is the the, the perception management the coaches want to have with the players and that kind of builds a barrier uh, when, when you want to put them in, in some vulnerable situations by pointing out things you could have done differently to, to better impact who, who the athlete is coaching. I don't know if I'm making sense. Yep. Um, what kind of strategies do you, do you use generically when you're doing that reflection in action to try and create an environment where the coach feels, you know, comfortable enough to be, cha to be challenged uh, without, you know, doing that perception management to these athletes at the same time without feeling that vulnerable, if that, if that makes sense. It's a really, really good question. And it's probably one of the most difficult things to do. Um, certainly as you're trying to build it, build it. When your first initial relationship and um, parts of the relationship, it's, it's very hard unless you've had any, a previous experience. And because what you don't know is what the learners' experiences are of, of other people working in their sessions, and we don't know what the experiences are of the learners having someone else there who's working with the coach. So if I become a distraction to anyone, then I'll take myself out of that situation. But I suppose the strategy that I, I use most often, which I think works best for me, is just trying to find out in action, I'm trying to find out what did the coach see? So I'm not going to come in and necessarily give my opinion but what I wanted to know is what did you see because if I give my opinion it's based on what I've seen and it might be that the coach didn't see what I saw it might be that they did see it but they don't deem that, that where they put it in their value system isn't as high as I put it so I need to find out have they seen it um, do they value it and if they do or they don't why and then how does it help the players to connect to the, the learners to connect to their learning so for me it's always the, the inaction stuff is always asking and probing and and as Bobby probably said like almost like a throne of grenades is, is but what is it you've seen and why have you chosen to act this way and what about what do you what do you think would happen if this happened so that that's the the, the analogy of the grenade that you're putting something in to really challenge and sometimes upset the thought process but it has to be skillfully done because if you upset the thought process in action you might throw the coach completely off what it is they're trying to do which actually then has an impact on the learners because the learners are there to learn and we have to make sure that the session is about them so if they're in there it's primarily about them the coaches that are being developed they're secondary to that but it is still also about them as well so it's it's a it's a really good question and there isn't a, and this probably comes back to one of the things that you measure, there isn't a one size fits all. It depends on, on the context of the situation. It depends on the relationship you have with the learner. It depends on the relationship you have in learner in terms of the coach. It depends on the relationship you have with the players or the learners that are involved and how they see and view you. Um, so one of the things I, I can say for when I worked with Bobby, it's obviously I would walk in with, with an England tracksuit on. And all the players would ask, are you a scout for England? So you, you, you quickly dispel that myth and then just go, no, I'm here, to, I'm here to, to work with Bobby. Or actually, I'm here to watch you guys as well, but I'm here to work with Bobby. So the quicker you can get them back into understanding, no, the session's about them. It isn't about, it isn't about my presence. The easier it is for the coach then to carry on doing their work and coaching. Um, I don't, um, does, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, Bobby, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. So, Matt, um, I know you've got a couple more slides, but um, there's a question I had uh, linked to some of the stuff Ricardo uh, had asked. 
uh, and it maybe links to something Steve Dover's put into the uh, chat as well. Um, and it was, first of all, well done for saying it depends about 60 times in that last uh, sentence, mate. So you, 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 you've nailed that one. Um, but the, the question I've got and maybe links to Steve is, how do we help the coaches um, reflect on perhaps the unknowns? Uh, and Steve's mentioned that, you know, is player feedback something that we could use um, regarding the coach's performance? But is there anything useful that you've come across that helps coaches really interrogate themselves? Because um, reflection is obviously the, the key word here, but we can only reflect on what we know. So is there any way of helping coaches shine a light on the stuff that they might not be familiar with? Yeah, again, another good question. Um, and the answer is yes, yes, you can. but sorry, it depends on what you're looking for. So the, you're constantly getting feedback whenever you're working, whether it's from the players or from the coaches, you're constantly looking for body language, you're looking for, for people's interactions, you're looking for their engagement, you're looking for performance, you're looking for application, you're looking for, for failures, you're looking for rejection, you're looking for how, how people then deal with those things. So you're constantly getting feedback. So I, I would kind of, flip it if, if in inverted commas and say rather than trying to take on board all the feedback you're constantly getting try and minimize it minimize that bandwidth and be clearer or get some clarity on the specific feedback that you're that you that you need or that was required to help you develop so if you're working with a group if, if you're a coach working with some players and you want to know um have I have I got the intensity right? You'll know because the instant feedback you'll get will be from the players either thinking um, either how much effort they're, they're able to put in or how much they're not. And then you'll make a judgment on if you think they're working hard enough or whether they need to have more breaks, whether you need to reduce that time. So you're constantly getting feedback. But then there are certain things in which, um, and this feedback's coming at you constantly all the time. And then at certain let times, based on what the things that you think are important you'll see different things and then something else becomes really important the best way to 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 so and clarify that kind of waffle dance if, if you like is depends what you're looking for so are you looking at something or are you looking for something so if you're looking at something you can look at the game and you can look at the performance and you can appreciate the performance and you can look at all the facets in it or you could be looking for a particular routine set play um, certain indicators and references that you're looking for so when this happens this is what i expect the group to do this and then once that if you're looking for something you then make a you then are able to get some feedback are they have they recognized have they seen something and have they now started to apply some appropriate actions so it really depends on what you and how you really um get some clarity around your observation in terms of i'm not clearly there's more ways of doing that but i tend to look at it is what you're looking for and what you're looking at the stuff that I'm looking at might just be uh, might be a broader scope of stuff. The stuff I'm looking for is generally a narrowed focus. The skill of um, the best coaches is that they can flip between the two really quickly and really concisely. So they can be looking at the whole game and then look at a facet really quickly. Take it back into the whole game, look at the whole game and look at another individual facet. Maybe look at six or seven individual facets and think about how that looks back, how that feeds back into the overall observation of the game on a, of a performance. But that's, that's a skill that, that, that you pick up from um, recognising the difference between looking at something and looking for something. And that comes from, from making decisions. And if we go backwards, we, the best, the best players, the best coaches make the best decisions most often. Okay, in order to make decisions, you need to allow for choice. If the choice is I'm looking for something and looking at something, I've made, I've made a choice why I'm going for one or the other. If I've made a choice of why I'm choosing one or not the other, I need to know why I've made that choice and why I haven't made that one. What are the bits that made me decide that this isn't relevant and this one is? But I need to do it like that because in the moment of a game, and I go back to the bit which Ricardo spoke about, which again was a really good question. If you look at stuff in the moment, once the moment's happened, it's gone. So all, all you're really doing is reviewing it. So, because you can't get it, you can't replay it again. Now, lots of things happen in the game very similarly, but they very rarely happen exactly the same. Even if it's just a case of speed or the weight of the pass, the speed, 
or the tra direction of travel of the ball, the speed of direction of the person, the thought process of the of different pe people, the, the score line, the weather. Again, it depends. So there's so much stuff. So what this is just giving you, this framework is going to, there's lots of stuff that we can look at. Within working with coaches, that might be a, a process we work through, but it might be on the, on the first three or four opportunities of working with a coach, all I'm trying to do is develop a knowledge of them and understand how I work with them, um, understand what, the, what their subject knowledge is and, and understand the best way for them to learn. So this could be a, a 12 week, a half a year, a two year framework, but it's just, a, but, it, but you have to start somewhere. So again, one of my useless phrases is first things first. If you don't know where you're, where you're gonna start, you know, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. So you've got to try and find a way of going, I know where I'm trying to get to, so I'm gonna take this route. And along this route, these are some of the things that I have to consider. And these, along these things that I'm considering, here's the stuff that I need to consider with them. So, and, and so it goes on and on and on. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, Matt. Yeah, fantastic answer. Thank you. Um, I think that probably hit Steve's answer as well. But Steve, if you've got anything else, feel free to chip in at the end. We'll let Matt progress with his presentation. Brilliant. Thanks. So again, so for me, a coach development model. So in simple terms, who are you developing? What are you working on? How are you supporting their learning? And why have you chosen to work this way? Now, any of those four can flip to the top. So it could almost be a, a, a rotating model because the work that you're doing with the coach, you, you might have to start with the what. What are you working on? Because then you can start thinking about, well, if this is what you're working on, what's your knowledge of the game that you're trying, or of the learning that, of, that you're trying to teach to someone else or coach somebody else? So it's really about having an understanding of some stuff. And within this model, there's, um, Again, so there's another model inside a model. Are you looking at a range of stuff that you want to work on? Or are you looking at depth of stuff that you want to work on? If you're looking at the what. The who it will depend on who they are and how much they know. And all the different measures that we'll look at in terms of what we think they know, they, they might know more than they think they know, which is generally the case. Um, but they just haven't really delved deep enough into it or interrogated it enough to realise that they know quite a lot about it. So again, in terms of the, uh, what's the other side of the model, it's about having a self-awareness and a reference of the biases um, and the measures, sorry, the references of the biases and the measures that we use or that we know or that we appreciate or that we like or that we prefer. Um, and then it's on the time to identify um, the some stuff in the learners that, that helps us to understand and recognize their needs because again it comes back it's, it's there first and then it's having a broad knowledge of learning but within an individual um, teaching focus so i need to know about learning and i need to know about the learner and i need to know about me but eventually all that does is it funnels back into a real individual focus of working with that particular person and then I need to have a, a secure knowledge of subject because if I, if if the learner perceives, feels, I don't have a secure knowledge of what I'm talking about, then why would I expect them to listen to me? So again, you you, and as the learner moves along this journey, and they feel more comfortable, they will they will start to challenge back and they'll probe and they'll and they'll ask some questions. And within that having that secure subject knowledge, it doesn't mean you know everything. Have, have, being secure in the knowledge that you've got means that you sometimes you might go, someone might ask you a question, you say, I, I don't know that, I don't know enough about the answer that I think I want to give you, but I'll go and find out. And I will come back to you with, with an answer. Now what you can caveat that with is, I will come back and give you an answer, but you don't have to like the answer that I give you. And you don't have to agree with it, but I will give you an answer and I'll give you a reason why I've come to that conclusion. If we start to look at the left-hand side of the model, we then think this is about us, if we're going to be the learners, and then we're looking at the who, so we're looking at the people we're learning, we're doing the coaching to or with, that starts to build that skill development. So not only do we build and develop our skills, the learners start to build and develop 
their skills. So it's a win-win situation, but it's, a, it's all built on an open process and it's built on relationships. The power of the, rela- of the relationship is key. And if you come in, if we come in as, as the coach developer with the perception that we know everything, uh, then we might be in for a rude awakening somewhere. Uh, because again, a, a, another colleague of mine, another coach educator, one of the people that I look up to and challenging me with a lot of stuff. Um, and they'll just talk about it. You, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know. So there's some stuff that I don't know about. So I definitely don't know about it. So if I need to know about it, I need to do something about it. I need to make a conscious effort to go and learn some more stuff myself. So therefore I can, I can still be a learner while I'm a coach developer. So just some best practice principles. And this is, this is the last of the slides, because like I said, it's really about just um, stimulating some thoughts. So the idea is, is we look at those, those four things about who we're working with, what we're doing, how we're going to do it, and why we've chosen it. So the purpose is having clarity of some required objectives. So the objectives really are within this, pro- this process of working for coaches, is to develop them, is to empower them so they want to know more about what it is they want to know about, and swap skill. But that also then means that you, if you link the other four things back across, so support the person, the processes, and the performance so that that's um that might be the what if we're looking at but that sort of stuff we're going to regulate the journey and measure the impact well, that might be who so is that their, their journey encourage the power of collaboration well that that might be how how we're going to support the learning that's where the collaboration bit comes in and then just relate the learning to connect the learner that's why i chose to work in this way because it's always about connecting the learner to the things you want them to learn about so that's my kind of rationale in terms of using that four corner model and and obviously if the std and i'm sure some of you realize it before is it's about that self-determination theory so it comes about autonomy um relatedness and connectivity so it's just making uh, sorry competency and it's just making sure that at the end of the process of working with the coast they are self-sufficient sufficient so again, use this quote. I go back to years ago and show my age, a UNICEF advert, I think it was. If you give a man a fish, you'll live for a day. If you teach him how to fish, you'll live for life. And you're teaching the coaches how to fish. So it, they have to understand the importance and um, the impact of them becoming, taking ownership and being empowered to develop themselves and upskill themselves. But it might be that they might not know how to do that, or they might need some more clarity or, or empowerment around that. And that's where we can sit and fit in within that. Uh, so like I said, that, that's the last of my slide. So um, like I said, I'd, I just wanted to, to put some stuff out there, which would be to provoke, to cajole some thought processes and to stimulate some thoughts for, for yourselves. But I also understand that um, there will be some questions because some learners like some real clarity. They're like, hey, what, I want this answer to this question. Um, so yeah, so if you've got any questions, feel free to, to ask thanks, them and I'll do my best to ask them, answer them. Thank, thanks Matt, that was, um, was great for me uh, for, for a start, you know, just refreshing some of the stuff that I've been exposed to over the years, uh, working with yourself and working with uh, our mentors, if you like, at Leeds Beckett University, as I know you've attended the, the courses there, the PG Dip there. Um, there's a couple of questions I think have come into the group, but I've got a couple that I want to kick off with. And it's trying to think of the best way to sort of frame it, but it's, it strikes me that this is such a social role that we've got. It's, it's very much these interpersonal skills is is what we're going to be relying on as as coaches and coach developers and supporting the coaches we work with. Um, What's been like maybe your biggest Eureka moment with, with that side of the, uh, of the role. You've been a coach developer for a fair amount of time and you clearly know the game of football very, very well, but it's very different to working with people. So what's been like the biggest sort of light bulb or eureka moment with um, the interpersonal kind of approach, the social approach to this, to this role? I think it's, it's just realising that it's not about me. And I know it sounds very, very um, simple, but... I, Another useless phrase, here we go. Um, 
and you, you can keep these. But um, learners are selfish, coaches are selfless. Let me quantify what I mean by that. If you're a learner and you want to learn more about some stuff, you're going to get it from every source. So you'll go to Google, you'll go to the library, you'll go to your peers, you'll go to the, and you'll take that information. But I'm being selfish and getting the information from lots of different places. If I'm the person who's the coach who's helping that, I'm giving, I'm giving lots of information, I'm giving strategies, I'm giving opportunities, I'm giving, providing um, ways and strategies for people to go and help themselves. So that for me was the biggest eureka moment that I always have to go into to working with a coach and it's not about me. So when I say about self let self um, being selfish and selfless, it is in its heart in that point where I want the learners and the learners don't care about any they do. They do care. But what they care about is their learning and they, they care about making sense of their learning and they care about being able to apply it. And generally in this because of the world we're in in terms of sports, they they they're conscious about turning that learning into application and into a performance. So of course they they're going to want some stuff, and they will come back and keep coming and using us for information. So the bit that I have to be biggest eureka moment for me was, um, and it did happen to me a few times, was to realise I can't be, I can't take it personally. So somebody will come and take some stuff from me, and they'll go, and then they'll come later and they want some more stuff, and that's okay. That's okay. So for me, that was the biggest eureka moment that it's not about me. And so when you're working with others, it's exactly that. They come first. That's, um, that's a really nice sentiment, Matt. Um, and great to hear and maybe something we can all take um, from those words. Um, I want to ask maybe a more personal question about your own, your own journey as a, a coach developer. What's been the biggest challenge for you? Like what's been the biggest hurdle to overcome in your, um, in your coach development work? Good question. Good question, Bobby. I can see you smiling when right? your, your computer pops <laughs> up as well. Um, I'll be honest. The biggest challenge has been, will continue to be, and will always be my bias, um, which is why I say look at yourself first. So all of us have a way in which we prefer to work or think things should be done. But we come up with learners who don't think the same way and don't work the same way. And when you're working with someone with everything that you believe in is screaming at you saying that you're doing it wrong, you have, you have to tone that down because it comes back to the question you asked for. It's not about me. It's not about my way and the way that I do it. I have to understand why, they are, why the learners are working in the way they're learning. And it isn't subtly to cajole them into thinking my way because, it, again, that isn't right. But it's about getting them to reflect and understand why they work the way they do. And there'll be some of the people that work in a way which I would never work in myself personally, but that, that doesn't mean that I have to share that with, that, with the learner because that isn't relevant to the learning journey. But it's something that I have to work on constantly and think I'm finding this a challenge because my bias says learning is reciprocal. And my bias says that learning is built on relationships and my bias says that learning is is done by the learner and some learners way of learning is no just tell me if you tell me these bits just give me them i'll start to work the rest of the bit out so sometimes it's that bit of working out well people who know me never worked with me will think god dear me why don't you just tell me what you want um and sometimes i have to realize that and i've got better at realize, realize that really quickly that actually the learner that i'm working with at the moment doesn't doesn't respond best to me trying to control them. They need some short, sharp hits of here's an answer, some some cajoling in between another answer, some because that's the way they work. So that's been the biggest challenge, and it will continue to be the biggest challenge because because everyone's different. Yeah, that's that's a that's a brilliant um, response, mate. I'm I'm pleased you mentioned about about biases because we've all got them. It doesn't matter where we are on the football pitch, handball court, supermarket. We, our, our attention is sort of guided to various things, isn't it? So, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great thing for us to think about. Uh, Ricardo, did you just unmute to say something? No, no, I was just listening. Just okay. Listening. Um, 
Uh, Matthew, there just, was... Just, just with that, Bobby, sorry, just to, to finish that bit off, because I think it's important to say, and I say it all the time, biases aren't a bad thing. So we really need to get that. Biases aren't bad. They're, they're really good things, because they, they help you to, be, you know, going back years, and they help you preserve your life. So you understand some stuff. So biases are good. You just have to acknowledge them and recognise them. Acknowledge them, understand them, and recognise them. Um, so they aren't, they aren't a bad thing. Definitely. Um, so questions come into the group, um, uh, into the chat, and it's about um, the, the, maybe the the notion of coaching styles suiting different players. I'm not sure if you watched the Last Dance, uh, Michael Jordan um, documentary, the Chicago, Chicago Bulls uh, documentary recently, and you're nodding, so I assume you did. Um, the questions around, yeah, do. do can different coaching styles support different types of players? Um, and is, have you got any advice and stuff on that? Because, I mean, for me, one of my favourite phrases from that particular show was the, uh, you can't put a saddle on a Mustang, when they were talking about... Um, uh, Dennis Rodman. Uh, Dennis Rodman, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I, I, you know, there's been a lot of stuff around Mavericks and stuff like that recently on, on various other webinars and stuff. Have you got any thoughts on, on that, Matthew? Yeah, I, I think... Um... So I got caught up in two kind of different planes of thought there. Yes, different coaching styles suit different people. So I'll go back to something I mentioned earlier. If my, if my coaching style or development style suits you, Bobby, then we've got a real chance of accelerating the learning. If it doesn't suit your style, we won't accelerate some parts of it. It, it, will, it will just move at a, at a pace. Um, I also have to understand that within my, my, my preferred styles, I would say, that I have to be open enough to say to others, well, look, I can help you with this stuff, but if you really want to think about these things and accelerate through them, then I suggest you look at these things or speak to these types of people. So it isn't that when you're working with someone, they're mine and only I can develop them. It's understanding that there's loads of stuff, but I have to know I wouldn't go as much to say my limitations, but I have to know where my strengths lie and where my areas of development are as a coach developer, as well as that for the, for the coach. So any style can work with any style, but it will have a different impact. And that's where you come back to understanding the learners and, and you know, the stuff I spoke about at the beginning. It's what's the impact you want to have? What's required by them? What do they need? If someone is in a position where they need to understand some stuff quickly because, or quicker because their job depends on it, the learners depend on it, then we need to find a way of accelerating that learning without cutting corners. That's a really difficult skill if you're then meeting that person for the first time and you don't know enough about how each other work. So yes, it can be done, but for it to be as most impactful as it can be, all the stars have to align. And we don't know where the stars are until you start to build and develop that relationship. Brilliant, yeah, bringing it back to relationships is a really nice way to look at it, getting to know people and understanding what makes them tick, how they work, how they like to receive feedback, how they like to be spoken to, that kind of stuff. Uh, Ricardo, I think you've got a question now. Yeah, I think just relating to what you guys mentioned about the relationships and the bit more practical side of your of your day-to-day -day job as a coach developer, we all come across coaches who have um, and, and I, I'm guilty of that sometimes. I have huge anchors that will uh, keep them sometimes in, in the place with beliefs and, um, and even coaching styles and coaching cultures that you've learned from previous coaches, from your experiences that you might identify will, you know, impair that development and, and impair the, the connection uh, with the players and, and meaningful learning for them. So I've got two questions around that. The first one is, um, tips for us to overcome that those barriers that those anchors um, uh, bring us and then how do you uh, as a coach developer assess uh, that when, when you're obviously trying to develop the three pillars of the self coordination theory and get to that stage where you believe a coach is ready to fly uh, fly alone and able to you know reflect and develop his own learning so how do you start, I guess the question is, how do you start by building those barriers down and removing those anchors that sometimes are years and years old and they're very established and hard to remove? 
And second, and lastly, how would you then, after that process, would assess that the coach is half ready to fly solo, if you want to put it that way? Again, really good questions. And, and um, so I'm just making some notes as, as we're talking. So, again, my, my answer would be um, we are all products of our experience. So that's why it's really important to self-reflect and look in the mirror because we, we would have all have grown up and you said we've got people here from different countries and different backgrounds. We'd have all have grown up in our own um, coaching model, which would have been set up by our own governing body, which would have been linked to our own experiences as, as a country. Um, so you have to understand why we were we, why we learned in the way that we did, but also to recognise that the way that we learned might be different to where they are now. So to give you a, a, an example of that. And it might resonate with lots of people, but the situation we're in now, in terms of lockdown, is very different. So when we were homeschooling, my nine-year-old daughter was learning doing maths. I learned maths in a completely different way than she did. So it isn't for me to tell her that the way she's learned it at school and, and is wrong and she's got to do it my way. But my way's worked for me. It's, it's worked all the way through my life. So I know it isn't wrong. But what I do know is that there's a different way. And what I have to understand is that there's a different way of doing some stuff. So when we talk about the stuff that, that is ingrained with us and our anchors, and it's a really good, really thick, good thing, and um, because our anchors ground us, and it isn't bad to be ground in, um, in the knowledge that you've had and the experience you've had growing up. That's that exper experiential learning. Um, but we just need to acknowledge it, and we need to acknowledge that there are people learn in different ways. And just because I learned in this way and it works for me, doesn't mean it works for you. So it goes back to that phrase: what works for who, in what context, and why. Uh, in terms of the, the, the competency, competency bit, and, and if I haven't answered that if it, um, well enough, then let me know. In, in terms of, of the competencies bit, um, again, I've got measures and models that I use that I'm happy to share with you, but it doesn't mean that you have to use them. So in order for someone to, to, to display those competencies, it isn't about displaying it once. So to, to give you the measures that I use, and then I'll explain some more, I'll look at someone... Um, having consistent behaviors so consistent effective efficient if people consistently work through some stuff then you can you can go here and say they've got it they've got that because they can consistently understand it they can and they can consistently recognize it and do it so there's some consistency in what they do it doesn't mean they always get it but it means they get it more often than they than they don't get it once people start to become effective at what they're doing they they they've surpassed consistent um there isn't just a consistency in what they do they're really effective in the in the, in the way in which they apply their consistency okay and then the next but on the add on top of that is that they can become really efficient so they can see it they can analyze it they can deal with it and they can act on it really quickly which then allows them to work on the next thing so if you become efficient at what you do you've got more chance of going more stuff that stuff talks about range and depth so there's more things you can go after when you become efficient at recognizing some stuff, being effective at the depth of stuff and being able to deal with situations. That makes me efficient to go look at something else. So whether that something else is another moment, another situation, another facet, another individual. So like I said, when I said about that skill development, building that skill development is about consistency, effectiveness and efficiency. So you can still be you can still have skill development at a consistent level, but you might not be at an efficient level. And that is the, that's the journey that coaches might want to go along. If I'm looking at the stuff that you just mentioned, which again is a really good point about assessment. Yes, I do go in and do assessments with people. They just might want to be able to show consistent um, behaviours and applications, and that's it. They do enough to get their all, that's all, they, that's all they're interested in. And then they'll, they'll go. You'll find that there'll be another group who you'll go through and assess and they'll get to this point and they want to know more and they're more interested in becoming more effective at what they do. So get rid of the qualification. Are they effective at what they do? And then you'll get the ones who really go on and push on that. They'll be the ones who are really efficient at what they do. And they're your elite coaches and you, they, when you, when you watch them, you, you sort of sit there and they're people that we look at and you go, have they recognized that so quickly? Have they dealt with that so quickly? They've got a process in their head and they've gone da, 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 and they go to there. 
but they've used it and they know how to use it in which situations and why they're using it and so they become effective at using their own measures so i just i've just got i use that as a measure when i'm working with coaches what that does is it gives clarity to the learners that they'll go yeah but i've done that and i said but but you haven't done it consistently then we can get into a conversation well what is consistent is it four out of ten is it six out of ten is it eight out of ten and if it's four out of ten that's fine if that's an agreed process but if you're saying that it's okay for you to be a four out of ten to to, to to get an award, then it's okay for your learners or your players to be effective for it, to be consistent four out of 10 times. And if you're saying it's not okay for your learners, then it's not okay for you because you can't have two different tiers of models in which you're working with. You can't have your players working to where they've got to get it right. They've got to be consistent and consistent for them is 70% of the time and consistent for a coach is 40% of the time. Um, and if that is a model you want to work on, then my question will always come back to why? Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Thank you, Matthew, for, for the clarification. Bobby, I don't know if you want to... Yeah, Mr. Joseph, that's um, pretty much bringing us to a, to a close for the session. Um, it's been really great for me to, to listen to this stuff, and I hope the guys on the call have uh, benefited as much as, as myself and Ricardo have. Um, I don't know if you've got any things you want to close off. I mean, sometimes I ask what's the best bit of advice you'd give for any would-be coach developer, any would-be coach. Um, so maybe you can have a think about that uh, whilst we're closing out. But whilst um, you're thinking, Matt, I'll give you some more time. Next week, guys, we've got um, Andrew Abraham's PhD, who's going to be talking about connecting theory to practice. Um, he's someone that Ma Matthew and I have both, both worked with, and Ricardo too, at least Beckett University. He's a great, um, a great lecturer, a great practitioner. Um, so really looking forward to having, having him join us next week. Uh, so yeah, Matt, that's, that's me buying you some time. Best bit of advice? Um. Two bits, stay humble and hungry to learn. Brilliant. That's all I'll say. Um, yeah. Again, if, look, I'm going to put some, oh, no, wrong. There's my, my, my I, I'm happy to talk to anyone at any time. Um, so there's my work email address. That's me, get me on Twitter. Or you can do that, get me on LinkedIn. Um, probably like you guys, everyone's busy, whether it's home life, work or whatever. So I might not get back to you straight away, but I will get back to you. So if you've got any further questions or queries, or just want to interrogate the size and stuff a little bit more, you can do. Um, what I've said to Bobby is I'm happy to s send this out to all of you or make it available to you guys as a PDF to presentation so you, you, can, you can have it because um, I'm not precious about any of it. Like I said, it's about my, my theory is about being selfless. So if you want to use it, great. If you don't, if it's an hour you've lost of your life, I'm very sorry. Um, but hopefully you'll get, you'll get some, something to, to stimulate some thought process. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you again. Um, and, and good luck with, uh, with, with what's around the corner and, and getting back out onto uh, the, helping develop the coaches in, in, with the FA and the clubs you work with. Uh, guys, to everyone else, have a fantastic weekend. I hope you're well wherever you are. And we hope that you can join us next week for Andrew Abraham's PhD. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. No worries. Thank you very much. Bye.